message that we would like to send to you. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and divided the light from the darkness. And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas. Good morning. Anybody glad to be at Radiant Church this morning? I'm glad you are too. I hope you had a great holiday weekend. The family and I got away to spend some time. We don't often get all of us into one place. And uh, we went to St. Louis for a great weekend. Uh, went to Six Flags. And I learned that maybe I'm getting a little bit too old for the wooden roller coasters out there. But they're, they're like that fruit in the garden, you know what I mean? I look at them like, I want to ride that. I love, like the scarier the ride, the better. But then I get off of it, and I'm like, oh, man, I probably should not have ridden. Anybody know a chiropractor uh, you know, on, the, on that? But we had a great time. I hope you did as well. Uh, welcome to those who are watching online. Before we jump in today, do you mind if we just pray for a second, bow our heads, close our eyes? Let's pray. Dear Lord, uh, today we're going to talk about uh, you this amazing God. And so, Lord, as we jump into this conversation, help us to do so with just an enormous amount of humility. Our words matter. And so today, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you. May it point to you. And may we, whatever going, is going on in our lives, just humble ourselves for a little bit, Lord, to hear what you have to say, even if what you have to say might convict us or challenge what we know. We give this for your glory. In your name, amen. The Bible opens with this amazing line, in the beginning. I mean, what a way to start a story, in the beginning. Right away, we're, 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 we're thinking it sounds like there's some epic legend. There's going to be some amazing fairy tale story. Something really cool is about to happen. It grabs hold of us and captures our attention. attention. And, and opening lines, they do that. They, they capture our attention. I mean, if you go to the opening line of Star Wars, how does it begin? A long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. And I know that's true because Patrick and Ben told me it was. Because that's like all they watch. You know what I mean? So. So, so I know it's true, but I also like the show Merlin, you know, it said in the opening line of that, in a land of myth, in a time of magic. What an awesome way to open it. If you're familiar uh, with the Brothers Grimm fairy tales, uh, we, we see an opening line that we've heard many a times, once upon a time. These opening lines, they, they grab our attention, they, they, they capture us, and they, and they swoop us off into lands of fantasy and folklore and magical mysteries. We have stories of knights and princesses and princes, and, and immediately it's a battle of good versus evil. Oftentimes it seems like, you know, evil has the upper hand and, and, and good is facing insurmountable odds, and, and, but we like that because we like an underdog story, and, and we, we love it when we see the underdog overcome. We love these stories. We love these opening lines because it's great storytelling and it captures our attention. Anthropologists will tell us, and it's well known, that every civilization, every tribe, every country, 
Every great nation that has ever been has what it calls its origin stories. It has those stories that answer questions about where we come from, why we are here. And they're important stories because these stories knit them together. They often form common values that hold this group of people together and help them understand and navigate the world around them to make sense of the good, to celebrate when things, when things don't always you know, go their way. They, well, they don't celebrate you, but they help you navigate those times of understanding understanding, they give meaning, and they give purpose. It gives a civilization oftentimes its deepest values. And what we find out is that great stories, when you don't have them and when a civilization lacks them, it's like a person without a name and it's like a family without roots. We're not sure who you are. We're not sure why we exist And so these stories that knit the cultures together, they help us understand those important questions about where we come from and why we exist. These stories unite a group of people together. And these stories help us understand and give meaning and purpose to life. And so the real question we have to tackle as we dive into this new series called Origins is this, what story are you living See, everyone's living in a story of some sort, and so you have to ask yourself, what story are you living in? And more and more, we're going to explore that in this series to help us understand who we are. And by the way, I think this is the uh, reason for the recent surge in things like Ancestry.com in the last 10 to 15 years, where people try to find out who their relatives were and where they came from. More and more, I think people are trying to have an understanding of who am I, where did I come from? We're trying to find meaning and purpose in a culture that seems to have spiritual amnesia and have forgotten who they are. And in forgetting who we are, we've forgotten why we exist. And it's so important. That's why our origin stories are important. And that's why people have been reciting these stories around campfires for thousands of years. Ever since humans learned how to communicate and talk with each other, they've been telling stories about where you came from, why you're here, helping to understand and make sense of the world around them. Because stories help us to interpret things around us. They help us to make decisions. They help us to bring some comprehension to what's going on in the world around them. They, and what I'm really trying to say is those stories shape you. They are stories that shape you and they mold you and they make you into the person you are. Now, I think it's common sense to say, though, if we want to understand a story, you go back to the beginning. That seems like common sense, but all too often I see that in the Bible as well. People open the Bible up in the middle, or maybe we'll start in Matthew. Now, if you're familiar with, for instance, Lord of the Rings, Fellowship of the Ring, the first writing of that had almost 1,200 pages to it. If you're familiar with War and Peace, it had 13 to 1,400 pages in its original writing. What would happen if you took either, either one of those books, you open up midway, and you just started reading? Would you have any comprehension whatsoever of what story you were in, what was going on, the plot line, the characters, anything going on in that story? And the answer is maybe, but it would be really hard. I think we'd all agree the best way to understand what's going on and where the story's going and, and why it's important is to start in the beginning. And it's true in Christianity as well. This may be a controversial statement, but it's true. It's because all too often we'll open the Bible and we'll go to the, to the middle, or maybe we'll start in Matthew and we'll begin to learn. But here's something you have to know. If you don't have an understanding of who you are and where you came from, if you don't have at foundation that there is a God and what we did to offend that God, why in the world would you understand the need for a Savior? You know what I mean? To understand our story, you have to go back to the beginning as well. And the beginning for the Christians begins in Genesis chapter 1. And we see this amazing first verse of Genesis chapter 1 that says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Ten amazing words, packed full of truths. It could be easy to just read past this line and keep going. It it could be easy to just take it for granted. But right away in this first verse, we are faced with some absolute truths we have to wrestle and contend with a little bit. You say, what are those? 
Well, if you have your worship guide with you today, I encourage you to pull it out because we're going to do some fill-ins today, and I, I want to encourage you to write them down for a couple different reasons. Number one, I tend to find when we write things down, we tend to memorize them more. And number two, I want you to go back later in the week and I want you to look back at it again. I want you to reflect on it. I want you to pray over it and ask God, what is it you're trying to teach me? What is it you're trying to tell me in these writings? Right away in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, we're faced with three truths that we have to deal with. The first one is this. There was a beginning. There was a beginning. And if there's a beginning, there's an end. And we need to be aware of that. The universe is not all there is. The static state model of the universe does not exist. There is a beginning. There is an end. The second thing we have to deal with is there is a God. Beyond the beginning and beyond the end, beyond all time, God is above all things. He exists outside of time. He exists before all things. He will exist after all things. There is a God. And the third thing we have to deal with is this. He created all things. You are not one big cosmic accident. We learn more and more that this universe was intelligently designed. In fact, hundreds of non-Christian scientists more and more are coming to that conclusion. This universe seems to be uniquely designed for human life. If variables were off by just the tiniest bit, we wouldn't exist. The real struggle isn't so much the intelligent design issue. It's just getting to the point of saying, well, if there's a design, then there must be a designer. And right away, the Bible wants you to know God created all things, including you. And I realize you may not believe that, and that's great if you don't. I'm so glad you're here. Welcome to the conversation. Know that as Christians, we do believe that. That's foundational. So I ask that you just hang on and listen and, and, and think upon these things. I realize, too, that the world doesn't teach these things. You're not going to catch this in the media. You're not going to catch it in our public schools. You're not going to catch it in, in other areas of, of, our, of our society. These statements may even challenge the story. Remember, I asked the question, what story you're living in? These statements may challenge your story. And I ask for the time being that maybe you allow them to. Because I believe there are other stories, even though the culture would try to bend you one way. I believe that the story of God is one that will help you understand where you came from and why you exist and give you meaning and purpose in life. And I believe you need that. And I believe we live in a culture that more and more that's becoming unknown around us. Some may even ask, is this stuff even important, Pastor Jason? I mean, does it really even matter? And I, and I want to hear me on this. It's more important than you could ever imagine. This conversation we're having is not a light one. It's extremely important. The questions of who you are, where you come from, and why you exist are core to your very being. In fact, I will tell you this, and we'll get to this in a minute. You make hundreds of decisions every single day based upon the story you are living out and the core values you hold to. The problem is, most people never stop long enough to really investigate what are those? Who am I? What do I believe? And so what we learn is that the story you're living on does several things. Number one, it shapes how you see the world. In other words, it's like a pair of glasses that you put on, and these glasses can either color or distort how you see the world. If I put on a pair of red glasses, I will see the world in red. If I put on a pair of green glasses, I will see it in green. Or it can be like the funhouse mirrors you see at the fair. You know, some of those mirrors are kind of wavy. You may look at another mirror and it makes you fat and you want to punch that mirror. And then, you know, and then you see that mirror that makes you look skinny. And you're like, well, that's right. And, uh, you know, I don't know what's so funny, but... Uh, <laughs> But you know what I'm saying, you put those glasses on and, and your life experiences and what you've been taught and the things you've gone through, all of those things shape and color or sometimes distort the glasses you're looking through. And in the end, they shape you. The second thing is it defines your identity, which is answering the question, who are you? A question we need to be asking and we need to get to the bottom of in our lives. 
The third thing, it establishes your self-worth. Why are you here? What is your meaning? What is your purpose in life? Because that's essentially what we find out, is that a person without a story is a life without a purpose. And I want you to know you were created for meaning and purpose. Appreciated an article Pastor Ben sent with, to me this week, and we do that all week. We shoot articles back and forth to each other because we're nerds, and that's what we do. And, uh, you know, so he sent me one in particular, and I thought this quote from it was excellent. It's not anybody particularly important, but it, it, I think it hit on it. It's from a guy named Steve Gomez, who's a former FBI agent, and he was talking to ABC News. And he said, a common thread among mass murderers is a loss of purpose. They just don't know what they're on earth for. Think about that for a minute. Common thread amongst mass shooters is a loss of purpose. They just don't know what they're on earth for. And I think that's becoming more and more common out there as people have lost their story and their identity and where they come from and who they are. We lose our purpose what we ultimately end up finding out is your story is your worldview. And that worldview is when we're talking about that set of lenses in which you see the world, the ones that color or distort or shape how you see the world, that's your worldview. And the most important thing you need to know about a worldview is everyone has one. Every single one of you in this room has a worldview. You have a lens you look through in which you see the world. And I get back to what I said a minute ago. The problem is, is rarely do we stop long enough in our busy, chaotic, hectic lives to ask, what is the lens I'm looking through and how has it shaped, colored, or distorted how I see things? Most of us haven't stopped to do that. And we need to. Because ultimately, this lens that we're looking through that shapes, distorts, and colors things is life, and the story that we are living in, each of these are foundational to how we determine what is right, what is wrong, what is ethical, and what is moral. Oftentimes, when someone will come to me and they, I, they've gone down a road they shouldn't go down, they've made a decision they shouldn't make, they're struggling through something, and maybe they've made a bad decision, and I'll back up if I don't know them very well, and I'll ask a simple question. What's your standard? What is your standard? In other words, what I'm saying is, listen, this decision you make, what filter did you take it through to determine what was right, what was wrong, what was ethical, and what was moral? How did you determine that in your life? What are you using as a standard in your life? Is it the Bible? Is it the society? Or all too often, was it just you? Maybe you are the standard. What is it that shapes you? How do you determine right and wrong, moral and ethical? Ultimately, that's what we're asking is, what is your standard in life? How do you determine these things? How do you filter them? Is it God or is it something else? And so that's what this series is about. This origin series is about diving in and finding out who are we? Why were we created? Why are we here? Understand that this story as we go through Genesis, in particular the first three chapters, may challenge your worldview. It may challenge your story and I ask that you allow it to. Because it's important for us to answer some of these life questions. And again, I want to remind you, while Christians have a story, the world has its own story too. It has its own story to tell. And it's a much more popular story. What's some of that story? Well, the universe is all there ever was. You are one big cosmic accident. You're just an animal that evolved from apes. And you live, you die, and that's all there is. That's the culture story. How depressing. And yes, that's the dominant idea. What are we going to do as Christians as we live in a world that more and more pushes at our worldview? That's why I say the church in America right now is less a movement and, and it's more of a steadfast holder of the oracles of truth. The church at the moment has to be the people that say, not here, not now, we will not bend, we will stand by what we believe in and what the Bible tells us. We are more of a remnant than we are a movement at the moment. 
And we must stand firm. And we have to let the world know there is another way. There's another story. There's one of hope. There's one of healing. We've got to understand that story. We've got to be firm in knowing who we are and why we are here and why we exist. If we're going to tell and declare to the world that story, the people of God have a different story than the world. And you've got to know that. And so I ask it one more time. What story are you living in? Which one defines you? Which one has shaped you? What is your worldview? We're going to explore that more and more in the next few weeks. But for today, as we look at Genesis 1-1, we're confronted immediately with a big idea, an immovable force. The story of the Bible begins with God. And again, I realize you may not believe that. And, and the minute I say, hey, the story begins with God, we're faced with two truths right away that we have to wrestle with. The first one is this, do you believe in God? But the second one is this, if you do believe in God, hear me as I ask this question, okay? Who do you say he is? If you believe in God, who do you say God is? I want to wrestle through that one for a minute. And if you're following along uh, in the church, you know that we're in a Bible in the Year project, and we've got a calendar and a schedule, and we're encouraging everybody to, to read their Bible all through this year and go through the entire Bible in a year. And I think that's great. People have been really blessed in that. If you're in that project, or maybe you're in your own where you're reading the Bible in a year, good chance you've already come across a book called Job the story of Job. And today, I want to dive ever so quickly into this story. And so I'm going to be summarizing Job in a big way. And I ask for enormous grace as I summarize it. But my hope is, if your interest is piqued, go back, reinvestigate Job, reread Job. Maybe you have a fresh set of eyes now to go read it through. But I want to talk a little bit about Job this morning, if I could. Job was a wealthy and successful man in his time. He had done very very well for himself. He was well respected by the community around him. He was blessed. He had a large family. He had seven sons. He had three daughters. Life was going pretty well for Job. The interesting part about the story of Job is the devil goes and asks for God's permission to not only tempt Job, but to test him. And the devil's point is, you know what, if we take some things away from Job, if his circumstances get worse or things go badly in Job's life, he's going to curse God. The only reason Job hasn't cursed God and the only reason he's good and he's blessed and things are going well is because God is protecting him. But you know what, the minute he loses stuff and the minute things go badly, Job is going to curse God. And so God gives Satan permission to go down and test Job. In one day, only one day, Satan takes his house, he takes all ten of his kids, his servants, and his livestock. Job loses it all. It didn't end there. Then the devil went and, and asked for permission of the Lord to give Job painful sores, oozing sores. And the Lord gave him permission to do that. About that time, Job's wife said, you should curse God. But Job refused. He held fast. He would not do so. And he went about the business of burying his kids and moving on with life. The Bible says three friends join Job. And for seven days, they sit with him in silence, which I think is something for us to think more and more about when someone's grieving. And what does that grieving process look like? Sometimes maybe less is more. You know what I mean? But after the seventh day... Job kind of opens up this conversation by cursing the day he was born. And we go into these incredibly long conversations with the three friends in Job that are chapters and chapters long about who God is, how God works, and what you can expect from God. They have this long theological conversation for 23 chapters. This goes on. It's pretty incredible. Now, to just summarize, again, we don't have time to go through the entire thing, what some of his friends would say during this time. Well, the first friend would tell Job that he's suffering because he'd committed some kind of sin. And that the underlying logic to this is God, good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people and God's paying you back for your sins. 
which is a pretty sick thing to tell somebody on that, especially when you get to the New Testament and Christians understand there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. But can I tell you something? I meet Christians all the time who are wearing this weight of guilt and shame in their life who are saying, God's still paying me back for something I did 20 years ago, rather than believing and stepping into his grace and his forgiveness and his mercy. His friends are basically telling him, yeah, that's, that's, what, that's how it happens. You, you clearly did something wrong, Job, so you, you kind of got what you deserved. The second friend informs Job that his children probably got what they deserved too. Really bad thing to say to a grieving parent. And his point is that God, too, is an angry, vengeful God, and you get what you deserve, and there's absolutely no room for grace on that. If somebody has lost a child, please don't go say that to them. Friend three helps Job understand that he probably deserved even more punishment than God gave him, which is also really bad advice to give a guy who's grieving at that time. Here's the problem, though, because I've read Job several times. You can read through his friends' dialogues. If you just opened the Bible up for the first time and you landed in Job and you landed in those 23 chapters where his friends are giving him advice and explaining to him who God is and how God acts, you could end up with a really distorted view of God. You could run into some serious problems walking through that. And here's the other problem. When you listen to his friends' philosophical arguments, they sound good. And many of them, you read them, you're like, this kind of makes sense. He must be on to something. I, I, uh, this seems right. And yet it's 23 chapters of junk. That's why we have to be careful when we read the Bible. At first, it, it, it sounds like his friends know what they are doing. His friends were just giving their opinions. And you know what? It's no different today. I often sit down with somebody, whether they're new in Christ, exploring, or maybe they've been a Christian for a long time, and they'll start the conversation with, well, I think God is this, and I think God that, and I believe God works like blank. But do you see how futile that can be? I think, I think, I think. I want to ask you a question, and this one might be a difficult one. He's going to put it on the screen. Can the finite truly define the infinite? Think about that for a minute. Can an earthly person with an earthly perspective that only knows what we see around us, could you really properly define the creator God who is above all things? Or would be any of our attempts to that just be futile. And yet, how often do we try to define God by our limited understanding? Let me ask an even tougher question. When you think of God and who He is, does God exist for you or do you exist for God? See, that's a road that will take you down where Job went. Because what we learn from Job is that as Job speaks up to his friends, he doesn't much like what they have to say. He began to question God. And, and, and he began to say things like, why does God allow one man to suffer while forgiving another? And do I do, did I really deserve what's happened to me? And Job's starting to go down roads now of self-righteousness. Why? Because he starts the conversation basically by saying, but I'm a good man. And how many people do we meet out in the world? That's what they say. You know what? God's going to make an exception with me because I'm pretty good. I'm a good person. I'm not Hitler. You know what I mean? Really, I'm a good person. When the Bible says every inclination of the human heart is evil. And it gets down to, because when we have self-righteousness, next thing it leads to is some level of entitlement, right? I deserve this or I don't deserve that. Yet 1 Corinthians 10.31, it would remind us, whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. Why do you exist? Why are you here? What is your purpose? Your purpose is to glorify God. Why does this church exist? Why are we here? Why do we do what we do? Radiant Church exists to glorify God. Above all else, that's why we are here. We glorify God. 
Even in difficult times when things don't go our way, we exist for God. I love this famous line of speech. It was from a show called House of Cards. It was a crooked politician named Frank Underwood, and, and he said this. He said, you are entitled to nothing. Let that rattle around for a minute. You are entitled to nothing. Job's friends didn't like being criticized by Job, and they further explained to Job that he had a high opinion of himself and he didn't fear God. Uh, they really weren't very good friends, and the ultimate conclusion I have on this is Job needed new friends uh, on this. In fact, one time I was reminded of a story, no joke, years ago I owned a company, we sold really high-end audio, video, home theater stuff, and a guy walked into one of my salesperson, I remember he walked right up to me, he says, my friend says your stuff is overpriced junk, and the salesperson shook his hand, he says, brother, you need new friends, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I never would have said that in a million years, but it was true. And uh, at that point, here's the point in Job again. We have 23 chapters of human philosophy that can sound good on the outside, but pointed Job away from God. And how often do we do the same thing sometimes? How often does our culture do that. Luckily, a fourth friend shows up. His name was Elihu. And he started the conversation, Job 30 through 12. He said, but I tell you, in this you are not right, for God is greater than any mortal. He puts them in their place right away. Watch what you are saying. God is greater than any mortal, any human. In fact, what we say at Radiant and oftentimes is God is God and you are what? God is God and you are not. It's an important one to remember. Where things really get difficult is after that God shows up into the conversation with Job. And I really want you to pay attention to this, please. What does God have to say after 23 chapters of human philosophy and Job's pity party? Well, in Job 38, verse 1, it says this. Who is this? that obscures my plans with words without knowledge. Rest on that one for a second. Who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you, and you will answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundations? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. I mean, you were there, right? Ouch. How often do we speak words without knowledge? How often? After Job continues to put him in his place and orders him another piece of humble pie, he turns his attention to the friends. In Job 42, 7, what does he say? He says, after that, the Lord said these things to Job. He said, I am angry with you and your friends because you have not spoken the truth of me. You don't want God to say that to you. I'm angry with you and your friends, you have not spoken the truth to me. And so let me ask you a question that we asked earlier. Who do you say God is? When you talk about God and when you describe God, why do I bring that up? Because what you say about God matters. Hear me. Be careful. When you speak of God, when you describe him, when you think of him, when you present him to others, when you share the gospel. Be careful what you say about God and choose your words wisely. What I'll often say, and we'll learn through this series, you know, on the sixth day, God created man in his own image. And it would seem that on the eighth day, we decided to create him in our own. We call that humanism. 
Humanism is when we begin to describe God by human terms to how he works and what he does by our limited human experience. We humanize God. God is not a human. God is God and we are not. Be careful how you describe and talk about the creator of the universe. My main point is this, your final fill-ins for the day. God is not who you think he is at all. God is who he says he is. And you will find that in the Bible. Not through your friend's philosophy, not through the college professor, in the gift of this supernatural book with a supernatural message that God gave us so that we would know who he is and how he acts. This is where you will learn about God. Let this be your standard. Let it be your guide. So I end with this. The Christian journey begins with God. It does indeed. Is that where your story ends and begins? And even more importantly... Who do you say God is? Wrestle with that this week.